I would like to take a verse from Ephesians chapter 4, a well-known verse. Neither give place to the devil. Don't give any place, any room for the devil. Which means, of course, that Christians may do this or the Spirit of God would not have led Paul to bring this warning to Christian people. It is possible for believers to give room in their life to Satan in various ways. Now, I realize that there's a great difference of opinion between Christians in regard to some aspects and areas of the occult. I have 50 books on the subject in my library, and I wonder how they keep from fighting You know, one book says that Christians cannot be possessed by demons, and the next book says that they can, and somehow they seem to repose on the shelf in harmony. I don't claim to be an expert on the occult. Maybe you do. I'm still learning, and I'm willing to learn also. But I would say to you, as Paul said to King Agrippa, I beseech you to hear me patiently. Uh, Don't form a bad opinion because of something I say which disagrees with what you believe. But if you could hear me patiently to the end, I would appreciate that very, very much. Beginning then, do not give place to the devil. Some people ask the question, why bother? One preacher said to me, well, Billy said, really, I don't think there's any problem of this kind today, whatever. And so he said, I don't know why he even bothered. He said, "Uh, really, frankly, I don't want to hurt your feelings, but I think it's sort of a waste of time. And uh, so we we talked about this a while. One of America's best-known counselors, he's written several good books on the subject, and they are good books. In one of his books declares that it is not possible for Christians today to really be bothered by demons at all in any way. And we've corresponded about this. But he feels very strongly that Christians cannot. And I wish I could talk with him personally, not that I feel I could persuade him, but I would certainly like to get his insight on certain Bible statements, for example, in Ephesians chapter 6, where it distinctly declares that we Christians wrestle with wicked spirits in heavenly places. Now, that's got nothing to do with a demon possession, but it does mean that we are being opposed by these powers. And uh, so for him to say that demons have nothing whatever to do with Christians today, in my opinion, is simply not true. The lapel mic, think that'll be better? All right. I'm sorry. All right. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 20, Paul discusses the possibility of Christians having fellowship with demons. The word is devils in the King James Version. We should be aware of the fact that in the New Testament there's only one devil, but there are many demons. And Paul discusses the possibility. He says, brethren, I would not that you should have fellowship with demons. You cannot... Drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of demons. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? And again, I would say this. If it's not possible for Christians to have fellowship with fallen angels, with demons, then why do we have this kind of a warning in the Word of God? We may have fellowship with demons by partaking in occult practices. Well, things like Ouija boards, exposing ourselves to horoscopes. 
having our palm read, going to a fortune teller, and so on. There's about 150 areas of the occult today. There were eight back in Deuteronomy chapter 18, but the 150 today are nothing more than variations of the original eight. But any time I get involved in the occult, I'm guilty, whether I sense it or see it or know it or not, I'm guilty of having fellowship with fallen angels that hate God, that hate Christ, that hate everything holy, that hate the Word of God, and that hate Christians. So, we have this thought in Ephesians chapter 5. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. That word reprove in the Greek language, it carries with it the thought of reproving in the sense of exposing. Exposing. So we are not to have fellowship with fallen angels. Rather, we are to expose them. Reprove them, rebuke them. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we have a well-known verse. It says, we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. I think the marginal reading says shame. The Spanish Bible says, we have renounced the occult. That's the word they use. We Christians have renounced the occult. If we haven't, we should. And we should make doubly sure that we have no part in anything of this kind. Make sure, doubly sure, that Satan has no part in me. Christ said, the prince of this world comes and has nothing in me. Let's make sure that the prince of this world has nothing in us. Of course, it raises the question, I get it asked, I have this question asked me everywhere I go, can Christians have demons, or can Christians be possessed by demons? Perhaps I should point out at this, at this moment that the Greek word possessed in the New Testament, all it means is demonize, without telling us to what extent or in what ways. Demonize under the influence and power and control of a demon or demons, but to what extent or in what ways we're not really told. We very rarely see what I would call total possession, such as the demonic at Gadara. It says of him, and always, day and night, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. Now that's total possession, completely under the power, under the control, of demon spirits. Now, what I see in my work is not that. It's people who can operate normally most of the time, and then there are times when they cannot. And they're obviously under the control of some other power. Can Christians be possessed by a demon? I think we'd have to clarify our terms. I prefer to use the word invaded, although it's interesting to observe that a man as astute as Professor Merrill Unger, some of his textbooks on this subject are used in seminaries and Bible schools, and in the first several books he wrote, he said unequivocally, no Christian could be possessed by demons. But a couple of years ago, he wrote a book entitled, What Demons Can Do to Sinning Saints. Now, when the Moody Press had the manuscript, they sent it to me because they'd heard I had some experience in the area, I suppose, and asked for my comments on it. And I was very surprised because I'd read his earlier books. I was very surprised to discover that in this book, he says he's had to totally reverse his opinion, and he believes now that Christians can be possessed. But again, I'd like to talk with him as to the meaning of the word. Possess. Does he mean total possession? With that, I could not agree. But I do believe that Christians can be crippled. They can be hurt spiritually and sometimes even physically. Take the case of that woman in Luke chapter 13. 
Now, the account tells us that she was bowed together for 18 years. She was bound by Satan. And it says she had a spirit of infirmity and was bound for 18 years. And Jesus Christ set her free. But the point I want to make is this, that from what is said in that chapter, she was a true believer. Because Christ said, Ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, lo, these eighteen years be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? She was a daughter of Abraham. And by that, I don't think Jesus Christ meant she was a Jew. Because in the nineteenth chapter of the same Gospel of Luke, we read about Zacchaeus. And after Zacchaeus said, Lord, behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. Christ said, This day is salvation come to this house, for so much as he also is a son of Abraham. Now, salvation doesn't come to a house because you are a Jew. It, beca- it comes when you become a genuine, a true child of God. So then we read in Galatians chapter 3, the last verse, And if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So I take it from that she was a true believer and she had a spirit of infirmity from Satan and she was bound physically for 18 years and Jesus Christ set her free. So while I do not believe that Christians can be totally possessed, I believe they may be invaded physically, spiritually in different ways by these evil powers. Neither give place to the devil. Let's move on from there. We come next to the danger of extremes. You know, back in the days when Christ was on earth, there were just a few hundred uh, Sadducees and several thousand, maybe six or seven thousand Pharisees. The Sadducees believed too little and the Pharisees believed too much. The Sadducees said there was no resurrection, neither of angel nor of spirit. And the Pharisees confessed both. So the Sadducees believed too little, and the Pharisees believed too much. So you have the two opposite extremes, and you have that today. When it comes to the area of the occult, we've indicated some people feel there's, there's nothing in this area at all today. Uh, demons can't afflict or hurt God's people, so forget about it. And then you have, at the opposite extreme, you have people, and there are many of them, who they, they see demons in everything and almost in everybody. I mean... If there's a squeak in the car wheel, that's a demon trying to take the wheel off. If a cricket should happen to chirp in the fireplace, it's a demon. If there's a noise in the wall which may be due to the frost in the winter time, that's a demon. And so some people see demons in everything and demon, demons almost in everybody. I read a book a while ago ri- written by a Christian. And this person said, all Christians have demons, and if you have one, you probably have 50. And once a month, you have to get together with other Christians and have what she called a flushing out session. So you appoint one member of the group, and he takes over, and he commands the demons to come to the service, and if you get a queasy feeling in your stomach, that's a demon coming up, burp him out and breathe in the Holy Ghost. That's the kind of instruction that some people are giving, and some people are taking this. Personally, I think that's nonsense. For one thing, you don't burp demons out. Of 35 cases in the New Testament where demons were expelled, it was always done by somebody else, not by the person themselves. Which is not to say that it's not possible for a person to expel demons from themselves, but just to say it's highly unlikely and improbable because we simply don't have anything like this in the New Testament. And so we we have these extremes basically and mainly because people are not willing to be guided by what the New Testament says. 
Here are some other extremes. I look on them as being extremes. And remember, I ask you to be patient with me. There are those who teach that you cannot cast demons out unless, first of all, you get their name. You have to know what their name is because if you command a demon to go and you don't do it by name, then he isn't going to listen. What would you do with a legion? Let's say 3,000 to four, 5,000 demons in one person. Are you going to wait to get a list of all their names? Jesus never. Again, of the 35 cases in the New Testament where demons were cast out, in only one case was this question asked, what is your name? And that was a question Jesus asked, and he didn't have to ask it because he knew who they were. And the answer was, our name is Legion, for we are many. So they didn't really give their names. And he simply said, go. And they went, all of them. Now, if you were to allot five minutes to every demon and try and cast out 6,000 demons, you know how long it would take you? If you worked 16 hours a day, it would take you about 40 days. Obviously an impossible thing. You don't have this in the New Testament. Why do we have it in our practice today? Then we have the idea that in order to expel demons from a person, you have to start with the, with the buck private at the bottom, and you throw him out, then you move up to the corporal, and you throw him out, then you move up to the sergeant, then you move up to the captain, then you move up to the major, then you go up to the colonel, and finally you get the CO at the top. But they're telling us in much of this literature that you, you can't do it any other way. Well, it sounds like a neat parcel, but the problem is you do not find this in the Word of God. And I think we could be saved from a lot of grief and problems and save ourselves a lot of unnecessary time if we would simply go by what the Bible says and not allow our imagination or anybody else's imagination to run away with us. Because one of the things that Satan wants to do is get people involved in this area and get them involved unbiblically, and then he can burn up weeks of their time. And I've seen it happen. I think of a godly pastor, a man who was... Well, hardly a week went by that he didn't win souls to Christ. I respect him highly. But he got involved in something like this, and for three weeks he had no time for soul winning. And he had a long list of names of demons they'd supposedly cast out of this person, only to find later on that it was all a put-on by her own confession. It was a put on. And Satan had tied him up for three solid weeks doing nothing. Let's be sure, if we're working in this area, that we're working biblically. The outline is quite clear and simple. Paul said, We are not ignorant of Satan's devices. But we are if we don't know our Bible well. And we are if we're not willing to really apply this word in the language of one of the Psalms. Therefore I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right, and I hate every false way. Anything that does not agree with the word of God, I hate that, and I will not knowingly apply it or use it in Christian work. All right, the danger of extremes. Then there's a problem of recognizing real demon invasion. How can I recognize this? How can I be sure that a person has a demon? That's not easy, because you may be up against nothing more or less than the demon of self. Do you remember what Jesus Christ said? It's a very peculiar statement. I've never read anything on it. But Christ said, Have not I chosen you twelve when one of you has a demon? 
Now, is that what he said? No, that's not what he said. He said, one of you is a demon. Judas Iscariot. Was Judas Iscariot actually a fallen angel? No, I don't believe he was. But he had all the characteristics of a demon. So Christ said, one of you is a demon. And so there's what we might call then the demon of self. I asked somebody one time, I said, could you tell me, could you just give me a description of how evil you feel a demon would be? And they struggled with that and really couldn't give me an answer. So I said, well, I'll attempt one and let you tell me what you think of it. Desperately wicked. Oh, they said, yes, that's good. I said, isn't it interesting in Jeremiah 17, God said that about the human heart. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Desperately wicked. And sometimes people are up against nothing more or less than the demon of self. When we think it's a demon from Satan. Let me give you an example. A pastor, a Christian worker, came for counseling. He told my song leader and I, he said, I'm sure I've got demons. I said, why? Well, he was having such a struggle in the area of, of a pure heart to think right. He couldn't do it. And he said, I'm, I'm reading salacious literature. I watch the dirtiest programs on TV I can find. He said, my wife doesn't know a thing about it, but he said, you know, it's only a matter of time until it erupts like a volcano and I'm gone. He said, I'll lose my family. I'll lose my ministry. I'll dishonor my God. He said, I must have demons. Well, we checked it out. There was no sign of demon activity that we could discover. So I said, my brother, you're going to have to face up to something it says in the book of James. Every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust, the demon of self, and enticed. And he accepted that. And we went to prayer with him. I wish you could have seen it. It's one of those things I sometimes wish I had on tape, on a film. He prayed with such intensity, I thought his body would break in two. His body was just snapping back and forth like this as he called upon God. And oh, he wept before God. And he begged God to forgive him and set him free. And suddenly, in the middle of his prayer, he laughed right out loud. And you could just about hear the chains go clunk on the floor. He was free and he knew it. And then through his tears of joy, he said, Oh God, thank you for giving me the gift of repentance. I was never able to repent until just now. I hated it, but I couldn't repent of it. Thank you, God. And then the next night, he gave his testimony. He didn't refer to his problem directly, just sort of obliquely. He said, I had a very serious problem in my life, and last night, Jesus set me free. And I want to sing my testimony. We were in a church seating a thousand. There were not a thousand there that night, but there was a good crowd. And you'll never guess the song he sang. Oh, happy day that fixed my choice on thee, my Savior and my God. Well may this glowing heart rejoice and tell its raptures all abroad. Happy day, happy day, when Jesus washed my sins away. What a message. That whole church was melted to tears. I was weeping. Everybody was weeping. It was just as if God had lowered an angel on a golden cord out of heaven. It was one of those rare things that happens sometimes in this kind of work. And finally he got to that place. Now rest my long divided heart fixed on this blissful center rest. Nor ever from my Lord depart. With him of every good possessed. And he broke down and couldn't sing anymore. Oh, I wouldn't have missed that for anything. But he never had a demon. It was an uncrucified self. So we have to be careful in diagnosing. And many times we, someone comes and says, I think I have demons. So then we figure they have demons because they think they have. Or because somebody else says, well, we think they have demons. We pursue that. Why do you think this? On what do you base your conclusion? 
All right? That's one problem. Then I intimated already that it may be what I call a put-on. Here's what happened in Denver, Colorado some years ago. I had a crusade with about 40 or 50 churches. We went for five weeks. And the last Sunday morning, they brought a man to me after the morning service. And they said, this man's got demons. Pray with him. Well, this is a way back. I'd had very little experience then. And what I planned to do was to fast all Sunday, all Sunday afternoon, to pray, to ready myself for that final concluding rally Sunday night. And the devil knew that. So what happened? As soon as this fellow walked into the room, he fell on the floor, frothing at the mouth it seemed. Voices began calling out of him in different languages. And so we thought, well, it's got to be demons. So we did things then that I would not do now, but we began by asking, demon, give us your name. And he gave us a name. So we commanded that demon to go to the pit. And his body vibrated up and down on the floor like this, and it roared and roared, and his head went back, and his head was snapping, and all of a sudden he was limp. So we thought the demon's gone. And people, this went on until five o'clock in the afternoon. And then you know what happened? He got to his feet and said, well, I deceived you. And he walked out the door. I looked at my son and I said, hey. I said, the devil just took us for a ride. We learn something, we'll not get trapped this way again. You see, the devil has many, many ways of working. We had a case, this girl, they, people working with her claimed they'd cast many demons out of Matter of fact, they had a list which they showed me of all these demons. And they wanted me to help them because they weren't making any progress. There were always more. They never seemed to get to the bottom. When I talked to that girl, the first thing I said was this. I said, if this is a put-on, you'll be in trouble. And she went into hysterics. Oh, she cried and wept all over the place that I didn't think she had de- I said, I didn't say you didn't have demons. I said, if this is a put-on, you'll be in trouble. And I remember one day they were working with her and her pastor said, Bill, he said, Bill, look into her eyes. Look at the demon looking out of her eyes. I looked into her eyes. All I could see was a pair of gray eyes. I couldn't see a demon. Maybe I was dull. Anyway, I had a song leader with me, and he had some experience in this area because his wife had been demon-possessed at one time. And he said to me one day, he said, Bill, I think this whole thing is phony blow. And I said, so do I. But how can we persuade these people? It was about impossible. So here's what happened. My song leader, unknown to me, we were not staying in the same house, he prayed one night and he said, Lord, if this is a put on, strike her blind the way you struck Elamus the sorcerer blind in Acts chapter 13. Now, I didn't know he'd prayed this way. And I prayed on Tuesday. I said, Lord, if this is a put on, Bring it to a head at the latest by 12 o'clock on Thursday. And 11 o'clock Thursday morning, that girl went totally blind. She couldn't see a thing. And she was crying all over the place. How long will I be blind? What's happening? And at this point, I didn't know how my song leader had prayed. But I knew how I'd prayed. And then we got together. And when I told her, I said, hey, I said, you know, this gal is blind. He said, what? And he told me how he'd prayed. So I told him how I'd prayed. So then we got together with her pastor. Then he accepted it. Then we talked to the girl. We read the story in Acts 13. We said, now look, sister, this is what's happened. She cried. She cried. This was in the morning, maybe 12 o'clock. So when I had to go for a meeting in a high school, she never broke till 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Then she broke and confessed the whole thing was a put on. It was all done to get attention for no other reason than this. Remember now, this had been going on for almost four weeks. She burned up all kinds of people's times, but she was, time, she was doing it to get attention. What happened? After she confessed, in a half an hour, her eyesight came back. I've had six or seven cases like this now, so I never rush in and assume it's a demon case. I realize Satan may be trying to get me occupied with something that will burn up a lot of time and cripple me. So, we have to be very careful. Now, of course, there may be other problems. It may be due to senility. It may be due to the fact the person has a chemical imbalance in their body. I remember counseling once with a lady 
She and her husband, both Christians, and she couldn't get out of the house because she said if she started to walk down the sidewalk, the sidewalk opened up like this, and she saw she was going to fall and be swallowed up. Well, a lot of people figure, well, that's demon activity. No, it wasn't. She had a chemical imbalance in her body, and when that was corrected, all of this ended, and from that point on, she was perfectly normal. It may be due to a drug reaction, and I know what that's like because I had a very serious drug reaction two years ago. I thought I was going completely out of my mind. The doctors had given me chloroquine. And uh, later on, when I talked with a specialist back here in Saskatoon, he got the book down and said, well, let's see what the book says about reactions. And I had them all, every one of them. I felt like ramming my head into a wall. If I'd had a hammer, I'd been beating myself on the head with the hammer. I couldn't look at anything or anybody for longer than four seconds before my mind was just whirling in circles and I was in a deep, long, black tunnel. I couldn't even pray. It was impossible to even pray. And I thought I'm going completely berserk which I think I would have done but for the grace of God. And he came to me with a verse, I will trust and not be afraid. And I'll tell you, I held on to that verse. God is so good. But you see, people can have other problems that look like demon problems. I'm just trying to clear the decks. I'll be lecturing again tonight. And uh, we'll deal more specifically then with how to counsel and what to do and so on when you come up against a real demon problem. But I am trying to clear the decks at this particular point. We'll say this much as far as recognizing demon invasion. You have the, the phenomena of what's been called this inner resistance. It's a resistance to holy things. People get to the point when they really are invaded by demons where they do not find Bible reading profitable. They don't want it. The phenomena of resistance, it's called. They, they, can't, they can't listen for very long to preaching about Jesus Christ. I remember one lady, she said, I can't listen to more than two gospel songs and I have to get out. My mind just goes completely in a whirl. And I hate it. She was a Christian. And then there'll be less and less desire to be found in the house of God. And of course, correspondingly, less and less interest in the things of God all around the circuit. That is very frequently, not always, but very frequently a sign of a genuine demonic invasion. Then, when people have blasphemous thoughts against God constantly, it is not always, but very frequently, a sign of a demonic invasion. When people discover they can't pray, I remember once counseling with a man. He was involved in a boy's work in an evangelical church in eastern Canada. And he said, I don't know what's wrong, but he said, I have blasphemous thoughts against God all the time. Matter of fact, I blaspheme God at times. I commit adultery all the time. I know it's wrong and I hate it, but I do it anyway. I lie all the time. And I can't pray. And I can't read the Bible. We knew instinctively what the problem was. So he went to prayer. But he couldn't pray. And I was trying to lead him to renounce the areas. Well, actually, you'll be shocked by this. He was only involved in one area of the occult. And that was reading horoscopes. That's all he'd ever done. But he couldn't pray. And when we tried to get him to pray to help him, he knelt there and he ground his teeth. That's all he could do. So I said to my uh, partner, I said, listen, let's just believe God to break the power of demons in this man's life. And so we believed the Lord and we, we commanded these demons to loosen their hold on this man. 
because he was a genuine child of God's as far as I could see. And then he was able to follow me in a sentence prayer. My dear Heavenly Father, I ask you to forgive me for being involved in the occult. I know it's wrong. Please forgive me. And so on we prayed. And we got to that place. I now renounce the devil and all his works, including the horoscopes. And that's all as far as he needed us to pray. He cried out at that moment. He said, oh, my soul is flowing out to God. And he began to pray. You should have heard him. Oh, how he prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. As free as a bird. And that was Sunday morning after the morning service. And Sunday evening he gave his testimony. When he came down the aisle to give his testimony, I never even recognized the man. He was so totally transformed. But there's no doubt at all that he was genuinely invaded by demon powers. All right, other things that may be there. Sometimes people have pains in their bodies, pains that have no physical root. They go to a doctor, they talk about their pains, the doctors can't find any physical reason for it, but the pains are there. We dealt with a woman like this one time in Selkirk, Manitoba. I discovered she was involved in the occult. And I don't remember now how many areas it was, but I remember it was several, and we dealt with them. And she later on gave her testimony and said that from that night, all those strange pains that she'd had for 10 or 12 years, they ended. She didn't have any more. It was all gone. You'll remember in the New Testament that demons could afflict people in many ways. We know it's a case in Luke chapter 13, bowed together for 18 years. There are other cases where demons... They struck people dumb or deaf. We've had sessions where the person was not able to see. They could not hear. They could not speak temporarily until the power of these things was broken. But when people have pains that have no physical cause, it may be because of a demonic invasion. And that needs to be checked out. And we'll be talking about this checking out matter a little later on. And then, there's something I must say, and that is, no matter how you get involved in the occult, there is always, always a hidden price tag on your involvement. People come and say to me, you said something about the Ouija board and somebody got in real trouble because they used the Ouija board. I use the Ouija board all the time. I don't have any problems. What they're telling me is this. They don't have them, but someone else in the family has them because either you'll have them or somebody in your immediate family will have the problems. It isn't necessarily the person who does it that will suffer in this way. The devil has a different price tag. If he had the same price tag on every form of involvement, we Christians would soon read the thing and we wouldn't get involved. But there's always a hidden price tag on involvement in the occult. Let me illustrate. I I lectured on this one time in a church in eastern Canada, and the minute I finished, a lady jumped to her feet at the back, and she was crying, and she said, Now I know. Now I know. I said, What do you know? She told us what happened. They'd had a beautiful family, wonderful relationship between the various members of the family. Then all of a sudden, seemingly, she said, Overnight, my husband became an alcoholic, useless, no good, wouldn't work, couldn't work. One of her sons committed suicide. One of her sons had been sent up for five years in the penitentiary. Her daughter had disappeared, had been gone for two years. They hadn't had any word from her for two years. And she said, I never knew until tonight. But all that started the night that I brought a Ouija board into our home. Now, it hadn't hurt her. But every member of her family had been hurt by it. There is definitely a price tag on involvement. And we need to know that. So then when people come for counseling, you check these various areas out. I have a list of about 150 occult areas. I have the people read the list and then tell me what areas they may have been involved in. And then we take it from there. Now, 
if a person is a Christian and goes into the occult deliberately in a state of rebellion against God, it's always a much worse involvement, a deeper invasion, much more difficult for such people to get out. But where people are Christians and they get innocently sucked into this vortex, it's much easier for them to get out. We've noticed that again and again. We had a case in Winnipeg. I was in a crusade there back in 71, 72 December and January. And a fellow came marching up to the front of this church one night, began making obscene gestures with his fingers. He had a big red sash tied around him. And uh, one of our helpers went down to talk with him, and he squared off for a fist fight. But there happened to be a Christian mounty in the congregation in civilian clothes, and he went to him, so the fellow squared off, off for a fight. I mean, this was in Elam Chapel, a place seating 1,200. And the mounty explained to him, I'm a, I'm a mounty. Oh, the fellow quietened down and went with him. And there were several Christians, including one of my brother, that talked to him before they took him away. And he said, look, you guys, I've got four demons, and they're my best friends. Leave me alone. So they couldn't do anything for him or with him. They suspected it was demonic. We never really knew, but thank God, several years after that, that man became a Christian, so I was told, an outstanding follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. He may have had demons. I don't know. Certainly his actions, people who sat next to him in the pew, they said all the time he was mumbling and muttering and op, uh, uttering obscenities and so on. So if it wasn't demons, it was certainly self. But to recognize it, let me interject a totally different thought here. We need it, James 1, 5-7. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that gives to all men liberally and upbraids not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavers is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. If it wasn't for the wisdom that God gives, I could never carry on the kind of work I do. This is only a sideline. This is not my major work, but I usually lecture in every crusade for about 40 minutes on the subject of the occult. Then give an invitation. I've had anywhere from zero to 45 people respond. Almost never is it zero. Usually four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fifteen, twenty, thirty people come forward, and as many as 45. All of them professing Christians, and all of them involved in the occult. It's an enormous problem. And so, I've learned to ask God for wisdom. And he gives to all men liberally all the wisdom we'll ever need. A Mennonite lady came one time and she said, You know, I asked Jesus Christ into my heart when I was 14. She was then 74. She said, I've never in all my life had any assurance of my salvation. And as she was talking, it was as if God lowered between us a needle on a thread. I mean, I didn't see it with the eyes of my body, but I saw it with the eyes of my spirit. So I immediately said to this girl, to this woman, I said, Are you involved in the occult? And she said, Well, I used the Ouija board a few times. I've gone to a, to a fortune teller a few times. But she said, There's one thing I do more than anything else. And she says, I, I use the needle on a thread. I said, I know, because God just told me that. She said, I've used it hundreds of times. So we went to Deuteronomy chapter 18. She was horrified when she saw what God said about it. She repented, asked God to forgive her, and two nights later gave a beautiful testimony about the assurance of her salvation that God had given her. So we ask for wisdom. Then secondly, in Hebrews 11:6, without faith, it is impossible to please God. I would rather have two people who believe God and 50 Christians that don't when you get into one of these occult problems. So we believe, we believe that God will show us the nature of the problem. Really, that's basic to everything. How can I tell? How can I be sure? If I think they have demons and they don't have them, I'm going to hurt them. 
I'm not going to help them. More than that, I'm going to waste a lot of time. Oh, how I need wisdom from God. And when I have that wisdom, then I have to believe that God will use me, that God will use us. I felt so hopelessly inadequate at times when you have six people or, or 25 or 40 people and all of them involved in the occult, one man in 33 areas of the occult one time. We've had people involved in 16, 18, 20, 22 areas of the occult. And I knew it was serious. So I just had to believe that my God was great enough. And I've discovered that he is. And I wouldn't want to weary you with a lot of information as to some things we've seen God do. But I can certainly say this. It's been beautiful. And in 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul said, The Lord shall deliver me from every evil work. And he will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom. And that's a third verse that I take my stand on. God will deliver me from all the power of Satan. We have an even perhaps clearer statement in Luke chapter 10. Did you ever notice this? Jesus Christ never gave the 70 power to cast out demons. That is not said in Luke chapter 10. That's the only account of what happened concerning these men. You never read of the 70 anywhere else in the Word of God. He never told them to cast out demons. All he said was preach the gospel of the kingdom and heal the sick. But apparently they assumed that a person that had demons was a sick person and they're right. So on that basis, they commanded the spirits to go. So we read, And the seventy returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject unto us through your name. And Christ said, I beheld Satan's lightning fall from heaven, which is a quotation from Isaiah 14. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions. And in the Bible, serpents and scorpions are frequently symbols of demonic powers. And over all the power of the enemy, did you hear that? Over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Thank God. So on these three Bible verses particularly, I take my stand, three or four Bible verses, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world, and know that God wants to set that person free, and know that they can be set free, and pursue certain things which we'll talk about a little more in detail tonight. Something keeps coming back into my mind. I feel I must share it before I conclude. I had read a book by a certain man who works a great deal in the area of the occult. Matter of fact, in one of his books over the years, he claims he's probably dealt with 20,000 occult cases. And he told about a very bizarre thing where a woman, when she saw food, she'd run to the food, she'd stuff her mouth full, then she'd throw it all up, then she'd stuff herself full and throw it all up and so on. And she had a, a, a distinct demon problem. Well, I just happened to read this. I thought, that's quite bizarre. I'd never seen anything like it. Two weeks later, I was down in Torrington, Wyoming, and a lady came for counseling with her husband, and she had exactly the same problem. She said, nobody knows it but my husband. She said, we can hardly afford to pay the grocery bills anymore. And she was thin, not, not heavy. She said, when I see food, I can't. For four years, she said, I, I just can't do anything about it. I grab it with both hands. I force it into my mouth until I throw it all up again. And I, throw. And I said, were you involved in the occult? She was. I think it was four areas. We dealt with that on Friday night. And Sunday night she came with her husband and she said, It's all gone. It's all gone. Thank God. And I got home from that place, Torrington, Wyoming, to Saskatoon. And my wife gave me names of several people that needed counseling. One was a girl, a university student. And I remember she sat in my office and she said, You know, I... And just as if two hands have a hold of my brain and they're tearing it apart and they're throwing it on the floor and they're stamping on it, she said, you know, as far as I'm concerned, suicide is the only viable alternative that I have. And she said, then I have something else that nobody even knows about. I don't even want to tell you about it. It's so awful. But finally she did. And it was the same thing. Gorging herself on food. She'd been doing it for eight months. Gorging herself on food. Throwing all the food up. Gorging herself on more food. Throwing it all up. And so we dealt with these areas of the occult. It's one of those cases again I wish that you could have seen. The way God set her free. Once she renounced the areas of involvement, 
She clapped her hands and she cried out in an ecstasy of delight. She saw the Lord Jesus standing there. I never saw him. And she kept pointing to him and just at the top of her life, was, look at him, look at him, look at him, look at Jesus. And I couldn't see him. And then she said, he forgave me. Oh, he forgave me. He healed me. Jesus healed me. It was just so beautiful to see this deliverance from those powers. Well, one other thought, and I conclude. Sometimes, people, when they have these problems, they they won't tell you the truth. And they, they'll beat around the bush. Of course, they do this in other areas of counseling as well. And so, and this is an emphasis we've been getting in the sessions already. My heart has to be right. I should never venture into an area like this unless my heart is right. Unless I'm walking with God. Or you'll be made a fool of. And you'll not help people, you'll hurt them. And so we have to be filled with God's Holy Spirit. Whenever I lecture on this subject of my crusades, I always fast at least a day and maybe two days. Christ, you remember, said this kind, there are different kinds of spirits. This kind goes not out but by prayer and fasting. But here's something to encourage you before I conclude. The disciple said, Master, we saw one casting out devils in your name, and we forbade him, because he follows not with us. And Jesus said, Forbid him not. There is no man that shall do a miracle in my name that can lightly speak evil of me. But here's the point I want to make. Here is a man whom Jesus Christ had not commissioned, yet he was successfully casting demons out. And so, God wants to help people. Certainly he does. There's much of this around today. So many books written on the subject. I get weary sometimes, I must confess, dealing with people in this area. But the fact they can be helped by the power of God keeps me going in it. And some cases have been outstanding. And we've had some failures. I think of one man we counseled with about the demonic and he took his life a week later. But we found out that he hadn't been honest. He hadn't told us the whole story of the involvement. When he confessed, he confessed it all but one particularly bad area that he was too embarrassed, I guess, to share with us. And they got him. Well, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you notwithstanding in this rejoice not that your names are written or rejoice not that the demons and spirits are subject unto you but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven.